There's no end to the number of interpretations that you can make of it. You know, you can interpret each word, you can interpret each phrase, each sentence, each paragraph, you can interpret the entire play. The way you interpret it depends on how many other books you've read, depends on your orientation in the world, it, it, it depends on a very, very large number of things, how cultured you are or how, how much culture you lack, all of those things. It, it opens up a huge, a huge vista for potential interpretation. And The interpret so the postmodernists extended that critique to the world. They said, look, while well, a text is complicated enough, you can't extract out a canonical interpretation. What about the world? The world's way more complicated than a text, and so there's an infinite number of ways that you can look at the world. And so how do we know that any one way is better than any other way? And that's a good question. Now, the postmodern answer was, we can't. And that's not a good answer, because you drown in chaos under those circumstances, right? You can't make sense of anything, and that's not good, because it's not neutral to not make sense of things. It's very anxiety-provoking. It's very depressing, because if things are so chaotic that you can't get a handle on them, your body defaults into emergency preparation mode, and your heart rate goes up, and your immune system stops working, and like you burn yourself out, you age rapidly, because you're surrounded by Nothing you can control. It's varying. That's an existential crisis, right? It's anxiety provoking and depressing. Very hard on people. And even more than that, it turns out that the way that we're constructed neurophysiologically is that we don't experience any positive emotion unless we have an aim and we can see ourselves progressing towards that aim. It isn't precisely attaining the aim that makes us happy. As you all know, if you've ever attained anything, because as soon as you attain it, then the whole little game ends, then you have to come up with another game, right? So it's, it's Sisyphus, and that, that's okay, but, but it does show that the attainment can't be the thing that drives you because it collapses the game. That's what happens when you graduate from university. It's like, you're king of the mountain for one day, and then you're like surf at, 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 at Starbucks for the next five years, you know? So, yeah. So what happens is that, that human beings are weird creatures because we're much more activated by having an aim and moving towards it than we are by attainment. And what that means is you have to have an aim, and that means you have to have an interpretation. And it also means that the nobler the aim, that's one way of thinking about it, the better your life. And that's a really interesting thing to know, because you know, you've heard ever since you were tiny that you should act like a good person, and you shouldn't lie, for example. And you might think, well, why the hell should I act like a good person, and why not lie? I mean, even a three-year-old can ask that question, because smart, smart kids learn to lie earlier, by the way. And they, they think, well, why not twist the fabric of reality so that it serves your specific short-term needs? I mean, that's a great question. Why not do that? Why act morally? If you can get away with something, and it, it brings you closer to something you want, well, why not do it? These are good questions. It's not self-evident. Well, it seems to me tied in with what I just mentioned. It's like, you destabilize yourself and things become chaotic, that's not good. And if you don't have a noble aim, then you have nothing but, but shallow, trivial pleasures. And they don't sustain you. And that's not good because, because life is so difficult, so much, it's so much suffering, it's so complex. It ends and everyone dies and it's painful. It's like without a noble aim, how can you withstand any of that? You can't. You become desperate, and once you become desperate, things go, things go from bad to worse very rapidly when you become desperate. And so there's the idea of the noble aim, and it's, it's not something, it's, it's something that's necessary. It's the bread that people cannot live without, right? That's not physical bread. It's the noble aim. And what is that? Well, it was encapsulated in part in the story of Marduk. That's, that's, it's to pay attention. It's to speak properly. It's to confront chaos. It's to make a better world. It's something like that. And that's enough of a noble aim so that you can stand up without, you know, cringing at the very thought of your own existence so that you can do something that's worthwhile to justify your wretched position on the planet. So, now there's a, the literary issue is that, so, look, you take a text, you can interpret it a variety of ways, but that's not right. This is where the postmodernists went wrong because what you're looking for in a text, and in the world for that matter, is, is sufficient order and direction. So then we have to think, well, what does sufficient order and direction mean? 
well, you don't want to suffer so much that your life is unbearable, right? That just seems self-evident. Pain argues for itself. I think of pain as the fundamental reality because no one disputes it, right? I mean, even if you say that you don't believe in pain, it doesn't help when you're in pain. You still believe in it, right? It's, 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 you can't pry it up with logic and rationality. It just stands forth as, as what the fundament of existence, and that's actually quite useful to know. Say, well, you don't want any more of that than is absolutely necessary. And I think that's self-evident. And then you say, well, wait a minute, it's more complicated than that. You don't want any more of that that's necessary today, but also not tomorrow and not next week and not next month and not next year. So however you act now, better not compromise how you're going to be in a year, because that'll just be counterproductive. That's part of the problem with short-term pleasures, right? It's like act in haste, repent at leisure. Everyone knows exactly what that means. So you have to act in a way that works now and tomorrow and next week and next month and so forth. And so you have to take your future self into account. And human beings can do that. And taking your future self into account isn't much different than taking other people into account. Right? Because I remember there's this Simpson episode. And uh, Homer downs a quart of mayonnaise and vodka. <laughs> and he says, um, someone, Marge says, you know, you shouldn't really do that. And Homer says, that's a problem for future Homer. I sh <laughs> I'm sure glad I'm not that guy. <laughs> That's so ridiculously comical, you know, but, but, okay, but you see, we have to grapple with that, and so the you that's out there in the future is sort of like another person, and so figuring out how to conduct yourself properly in relationship to your future self isn't much different than figuring out how to conduct yourself in relationship to other people, but then we could expand the constraints. Not only does the interpretation that you extract have to protect you from suffering and give you an aim, but it has to do it in a way that's iterable, so it works across time, and then it has to work in the presence of other people so that you can cooperate with them and compete with them in a way that doesn't make you suffer more. And people are, they're, they're not that tolerant. You know, I mean, they have choices. They don't have to hang around with you. They can hang around with any one of these other primates. And so if you don't act properly, at least within certain boundaries, it's like you're just cast aside. And so people are broadcasting information at you all the time about how you need to interpret the world so they can tolerate being around you. And you need that because socially isolated, you're insane and then you're dead. No one can tolerate being alone for any length of time. We can't maintain our own sanity without continual feedback from other people because it's too damn complicated. So you're constrained by your own existence and then you're constrained by the existence of other people. And then you're also constrained by the world. You know, if I read Hamlet and what I extract out of that is the idea that I should jump off a bridge. It's like it's, it, it puts my interpretation to an end rather, rather quickly. It doesn't seem to be optimally functional, let's say. And so an interpretation has, is constrained by the reality of the world, it's constrained by the reality of other people, and it's constrained by your reality across time. And There's only a small number of interpretations that are going to work in that tightly defined space. And so that's part of the reason that the postmodernists are wrong. It's also part of the reason, by the way, that AI people who've been trying to make intelligent machines have had to put them in a body. Because it turns out that you just can't make something intelligent in some sense without it being embodied. And it's partly for the reasons that I just described. Is you need constraints on the system before you need constraints on the system so that the system doesn't drown in an infinite sea of interpretation. It's something like that. So, that's the literary end of it. Moral. Well, morality for me is about action. And I'm an existentialist in some sense. And what that means is that I believe that what people believe to be true is what they act out, not what they say. And so there's lots of definitions of truth. I mean, truth is a very expansive word. And you can think of objective truth. But behavioral truth isn't the same as objective truth. What you should do isn't the same as what is. As far as I can tell, people debate that, but I think the reason that that has to be the case is because, think about it this way, you're standing in front of a field, and you can see the field, but the field doesn't tell you how to walk through it. There's an infinite number of ways you could walk through it, and so you can't extract out 
an inviolable guide to how you should act from the array of facts that are in front of you. Because there's just too many facts. And they don't have directionality. And, but you, you need to know. You need to know how not to suffer. And you need to know what your aim is. And so you have to overlay that objective reality with some interpretive structure. And it's the nature of that interpretive structure that we're going to be aiming at hard. I've given you some hints about it already. We've extracted it in part from observations of our own behavior and other people's behavior. And we've extracted it in part by the nature of our embodiment that's been shaped over you know, hundreds of millions of years. But we, we see the infinite plane of facts and we impose a moral interpretation on it. And the moral interpretation is what to do about what is. And that's associated both with security, because you just don't need too much complexity, and also with aim. And so we're mobile creatures, right? We need to know where we're going, because all we're ever concerned about, roughly speaking, is where we're going. That's what we need to know. Where are we going? What are we doing and why? And that's not the same question as what is the world made of objectively. It's a different question. It requires different answers.